everybody, uh, my name is Paloma Celis Carvajal. Thank you so much for being here. I'm the curator for Latin American, Iberian, and U.S. Latino collections in, the, in our research centers. And um, first of all, thanks to Mela and to Silvina for accepting the, the invitation to Camilo Otero, who's back there. Um, because this, this, uh, this talk is being done in collaboration with the Center for Book Arts, I'm sorry, Center for Book Arts. Um, <laughs> And it's, um, it, yesterday was the opening of Mela's exhibition at Center for Book Arts called Off Register Publishing Experiments by Women Artists in Latin America, 1960 to 1990. Um, I highly recommend you have the, the booklet that you have in your hands. The yellow one is the, the, the catalog or the program for, for, the, for the exhibition. Um, it's not far away. It's a, 10 minute walk from here, so please go uh, see it. It's up till December 16th. Right. And um, today what we will have is Mela first, well, Mela Darila Freire will first be talking about the curatorial work behind the exhibition. And then um, Silvina Lopez Medin, thank you also for being here, uh, will be in conversation, they will have a, a conversation and then it will be open to the public. The idea of this talk was also to bring some, a little sample of, of our collections that have to do with a topic to encourage you to come back, to pique your curiosity of what we have also, as, as we said, this is a very small sample. Please page through the books except for these three over here. The other ones are for you to page. There's also an exhibition case outside um, of other uh, items that, that are related to, to the topic. And I'll leave it at that, and I'll let Mela start the talk. Oh, and of course, please, uh, for any questions that you might have, it will be once it's, it's open for, for questions. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paloma. <laughs> thank you very much, Paloma. Thank you very much, Camilo. And thank you very much, everybody, for being here. I am, um, of course, very excited to talk about an exhibition that I have been working on for over I mean, almost two years. But it is particularly exciting to be talking about the exhibition here in this setting with, with this amazing library. And also, and I think I should start by, by underlining this, I think um, it is the first time in my life that I'm able to connect to a, to a public event, a presentation in a kind of white uh, cube uh, context where you can just go and have a look at the books but not touch them, not read them, not browse through them, with a presentation from a library where you are actually expected and invited to go and you know hold the book in your hands and, and, and have a, completely different access to them in comparison to that which you will have in an, in an exhibition room. So I think this is quite important for me. I hope I, hope I manage somehow to connect both things in, in, the, present, in the presentation that we're going to have today. Um, so I think, um, I think I should start by, by explaining a little bit the context for the exhibition. The exhibition deals with, or the, the focus of the exhibition are the artist publications that were done by Latin American artists between 1960 and 1990. And the reason why I chose that topic um, has to do with a kind of a wider um, research context that I've been involved in for a number of years now. Um, that has to do with the fact that for, I mean, over 20 years I have been reading and, and seeing exhibitions and also organizing exhibitions about artist books. And when you talk, when, when we were discussing these periods, 1960 to 1990, it was always, you know, men's business, and that was uh, something that I, I had this experience as a, as a, as a kind of a member of the public when I went to exhibitions that had been organized by somebody else, but also when I was in contact with coll collectors who just didn't have any works by women, and um, also when I was like working with antiquarians and dealers who just didn't, also didn't have works by women. And of course, I mean, not to talk about the bibliography where you just wouldn't find much information about, I mean, very few are the women who are uh, regularly mentioned in this, in this uh, span of years. So at the beginning, when I started working in the, in the field of artist publications, this was something that we kind of took for granted, as it happened in many, many other fields. But since I started up to nowadays, you know, I mean, you all know a, a, a lot of kind of revision work has been done in almost every field in art, and you have now, you know, uh, 
like revision, re um, bibliography where you can find information about video, uh, women video artists, women sculptures, women paint painters, etc. But the field of artist books has remained or, or still remains as some kind of, you know, hard place where, where people just don't research women's work. And um, differently to what I thought in the past, I now think that it is not that there are not those women, it's probably the fact that the field has not been researched enough. Um, and this was my motivation when I started this kind of broader project that encloses, I mean, not only women from Latin America, but women from the West in general, no? from, from that, that South America, North America, and Europe. And so when I started, when, I, when, I, when this project started, when my, my wider research project started, I also wanted um, my research to be a little bit experimental in terms of uh, academic kind of um, regulations, if you want. So I decided that I would want to, I would try to publish um, partial results of what I was finding out as I went along. And I decided to name those, those presentations or those disseminations of public results, ensayos, which is a word which is, I think, very interesting in, in Spanish, um, but slightly different in English. Ensayo has three main meanings in Spanish. It means trial or, or experiment or test. Um, but it also means rehearsal, and both of these meanings have something which is, you know, provisory uh, or temporary or not or indefinite. But it also means essay in the academic context. And when you write an essay, what you usually do is you make a statement, which is something definite and not so temporary or not so provisory. So I, I was very interested in the tension between trial or experiment and statement, and uh, and this is how I named the series of. of mostly self-published publications that I that I started producing when I started researching. So the first one, just so that you see what I what I mean, I mean they are very kind of many of them are very kind of like modest publications. The first one was was precisely devoted to this double meaning of the word ensayo. It was written in Spanish, it was published in collaboration with a, with the library of a, of a fine arts faculty in, in Madrid. And it dealt with three books, three yeah, I should say three artist books by three different women who had, um, in different ways, made an effort to include other voices in their own texts, so as to kind of build up some sort of polyphonic voice or something. I don't want to go deeper into that now, but I just want to mention it because I think at the end of my talk uh, we will see how it connects to what I'm, to what I'm doing right now. So this is Ensayo Uno, and this is Ensayo Dos, which was um, the second thing that I did. The second thing that I did was, okay, um, I thought, okay, since I don't have much bibliography to start with, but I do know a lot of people who are very knowledgeable in, in artist books, I'm going to ask them uh, what books by women artists they know. So I sent, them, I sent them an email with a sort of survey, if you want, with only one question. And this was the question. Oh, would you please name your three favorite artist books from the 60s, the 70s, and the 90s? And um, I mean, I have to say, this was not scientific in any way. I just chose 45 of my friends who might have the knowledge to answer the question. And so they were most of, um, I mean, for the most part, very excited to answer and very keen on like sending me immediately lists of names and then just to realize the minute after that they didn't have nine names to give. <laughs> so what I got were like long explanations and, and, and you know, and the expressions of regret. I'm so sorry. I thought that I could give you your nine names, but I can only name six or I can only name uh, three or I can send you 20 names from the 90s, but I only know one from the 60s or things like this. But in any case, it was extremely useful to me. And what I did was afterwards, I um, brought all of the results together so as to build up a list, which came, I mean, the list was in the end 100, I, I had a list of 100 women artist publications. And so I, because I wanted to return somehow the help and the information that they were sharing with me, I, I produced this poster, which when it's folded, um, it can be sent. This is what I sent by post, but this is the folder poster, and this is the unfolded version. And so in this list, I had finally, like a, for, my, for the beginning of my research, a list of 100 artist publications by women. Um, but then I started running the statistics, and I saw that, I mean, the first thing that I noticed was that there were extremely few Latin American artists I made a mistake here. I think I named Vera Chavez twice, and so I counted uh, 12 Latin American artists, but it's actually 11. It's only 11, so it's even less than 15%. 
And so I was kind of in a reflection about how to proceed with this when the invitation from Camilo came. And Camilo wrote and said, would you like to do something at the, some kind of exhibition at the, at the Center for Book Arts? And then it kind of uh, felt very appropriate to continue researching about Latin American artists in New York, which is such an important place, both for the history of artist books and for the history of Latin American contemporary artists. Since many of them came here to study and, and some of them some of them even stayed and still still live here or did a lot of you know a lot of their practice developed here and in any case i mean most of the contemporary art history has or many great parts of the of the contemporary art history has have been written from new york at least so it seemed like the proper place to continue with this research and then um well this is this this was the beginning this was how we um, both camilo and, and i started kind of defining the contents of the project. And I have to say also this, uh, I mean, I'm the curator of the show, but this has been a, an extremely dialogical project where I've, ha I've had a lot of conversations with many people who know like a lot about some of these artists, but also ongoing with Camilo, who was like the person at the other side of the line, you know, to continue the dialogue with. So, um, okay. The, in this way, I mean, the interesting thing about all of this that I'm explaining is maybe the fact that we had the idea and we had the name of the folder before we had contents for the folder. We didn't have a list of books which was relevant to start with. We just decided to create the field to kind of open the space in our minds and see what we would, would find um, when we started looking at, at materials uh, from this perspective and with this intention to find this kind of artist publications. Of course, there's a lot of bibliography that I could mention here, which has been extremely relevant to the scope that we took or that I took. But I just wanted to mention these two quotes. One of them, I mean, you will probably know them. One of them is Griselda, Griselda Pollock's question, what is it that I am not seeing? Because um, I think one of the things that I already kind of suspected, but I have clearly learned through the process of research, is that it is not just the artists, the, the women artists that are not seen, but also very many prejudices and expectations and kind of biases that we have in our minds that don't have necessarily to do with the artists. So, um, so the whole process had to do with not only searching for the artists and their work, but also uh, checking what kind of research I was doing and what was my, my own scope in the whole process. And then the second quote is by Andrea Junta, by a Latin American scholar. I don't know if she's based in New York or not, but I think she's quite often here for work, I have the feeling. Um, and I think I will read it to you. When subject to the selective censorship processes of individual or institutional curatorship, we are not allowed to see, enjoy, or analyze more than 70% of the works produced in the fabric of an art world dominated by a patriarchal canon, how many ways of understanding and feeling the world are inaccessible to us? And this I found interesting because it kind of changed the focus of the question. Uh, and instead of uh, kind of wondering or asking oneself, what are the women artists missing because we're not seeing them? The question is turned to, towards us and, the, and, and it kind of um, asks, what are we, uh, like the public or the art historians or the critics, missing because we're not seeing these works? What, what is it that we're, not, um, that we're not kind of getting access to? Um, since I'm very involved with a revision of what is called the canon of the artist uh, publications, I thought that was also very interesting. How is, how is my idea of what the canon is or should be shaped by not only by what I see, but also by what I don't see, because I have not had access to that. So that was kind of the frame, the, 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 the frame in which I, I started to work. Um, I mean, research has been amazing. We have tried many different ways. Um, in many senses, uh, it was very difficult to get to the artists and the works, because there were no um, sources, like no academical sources where to find the information. In other senses, it has been amazingly easy because uh, we had to talk to a lot of people to get the information that was not in the books or in the references. And, um, and it was uh, once you start like talking to the right people, it was relatively easy to get to the to the kind of the original sources where we could find material. We have also, um, I mean, in, if, if you go and see the exhibition, you will see there are many loans from libraries. I think libraries are kind of the category the, which we have most loans from. 
And this um, might or seemed a little bit more difficult at the beginning because it was not so easy to trace, but then in the end it was also much easier to get, it was also much easier to get the loans because libraries are much more open to, you know, having the books circulate because they have less restrictions than, than art collections, basically. So it has been like a very, we have done like, I think a, quite a long and intense collaboration with libraries. But we also have uh, private collectors. We also have um, a lot coming from the artist studios. I mean, materials that have probably never left the artist studios before. And we also have some things coming from special collections from the libraries and, and, and even from museums. You know, in, in in some in some few case, in some few cases. Um, through the whole research process, I mean, the, 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 question, the questions that I just mentioned were resonating in my mind all of the time, but um, so as to make it simple, I've chosen to discuss today three different ways in which I found that, uh, that I could know these reasons why these women had been misrepresented in, in, in the information that I had gotten prior to my research. So the first one is obviously artists are not seen. They don't have the visibility that they would probably well, have if they were male uh, in, in many cases, or if they were born in the right kind of geographic geographic area, area of the world. But in many other places, works uh, are not necessarily recognized as works of art. And I have to say this is not something that applies to women, but to artist publications in general. And then in some other cases, I think um, works, even if they are recognized as, as the result of creative practice, practice they have um, they have a nature which is so complicated to kind of assimilate by the regular standards of museums and, and archives and libraries that it makes it difficult for them to be absorbed by what we, we would call the art system, no? if you want. So I'll, I'll show you some examples. Maybe you know, I mean, some of you will know Gabriela Gutierrez Marx. She was a very important artist in the field of male art in the 70s and 80s in, in Argentina. Um, she did a lot of things. She's also very interesting um, to my particular, I mean, to me in particular, because she was very, very involved in um, trying to find different ways of authorship, which were collective rather than individual. And so she had a lot of works, which were collaborations in many different ways. Um, and she worked very much with, a, with an author with, who's much better known, who is uh, Edgardo Antonio Vigo, whose name may ring a bell to some of you. He was also, Anton, Edgardo Antonio Vigo was also, he was also a printer, as she was, but she, he was also very involved in the male art networks that were kind of expanding through the world in the 70s. And this is one of the first works that I found when I was researching. And, and I was, of course, very interested in, in these works because it was the result of their work together. I found it very nice that uh, the title of the work is kind of given in Spanish and English in bold and really like big uh, letters and characters. As you can see, the print is signed by both of them. But this is the quote that I got from the gallery where I found the work. <laughs> so, um, I mean, this is a very obvious example. It's something very easy, but it's something that I thought I should underline because I kept uh, finding examples like this where the role of the woman in the creation of the collective work is just ignored, even if it's so blatant as it is in this in this particular case, which is really, I mean, it's it's hard to avoid seeing that the work is actually the result of two people and not just of one. No? But I guess since it's coming from a gallery and galleries are basically, you know, uh, running their business in terms of market, the marketable part of the work is the man's part. So this is this is how they can identify the work. Um, so, one reason is that artists, women artists, are just not seen, but another reason is that uh, their works are, are not so easily recognizable as, as works of art. In this particular case, you have on the right a work which is already, I mean, extremely well known. This uh, was done by, by Beatriz Gonzalez, who's a Colombian painter and also printmaker and writer and art historian, I believe. I think she has written a lot about um, art history. Um, so this is a set of, of four posters which work in a diptych, and they were intended to be, um, to be, they are some sort of like very, quite in turn political comment on the situation of the Colombian government at a given moment in the 80s, and Beatriz Gonzalez uh, created them to be pasted on the walls in the street, on the street. 
But when the moment came uh, for them to be pasted on the walls, according to the artist, what happened was that the people who had to paste them didn't dare because they were afraid that there would be some kind of political uh, kind of repression against them if they did. So the posters were never uh, actually posted on the walls, except for some of them, which were taken by one of the artist's friends to Berlin and posted on the walls in, in Berlin. And there, and there are some very nice pictures uh, of these of this works posted on, on the Berlin of the 80s, no? which was also a nice context. In any case, this, this is a work of art which is already kind of stand, um, standardly acknowledged as a work of art, even if it's you know multiplied and, and has a, print, a printed quality and there's no original, it's a kind of an edition. But um, Beatriz González also did this at some point in her career. This is, uh, this is a, a silk screen. It has, I think it's one meter and a half. I don't know how many inches that is. You would have to help me. <laughs> it's, it's quite wide and very narrow. Um, and it looks like a kind of a, a print, you would say, but it's actually an exhibition brochure, or it was made as an exhibition brochure. But on the other side, I can unfortunately not show you the back side of the, of the, of the work, but on the other side, it has all of the information and texts, etc., related to the exhibition for which it was done. And what Beatriz González did at the moment was she didn't fold it, but rather uh, kind of set it in a roll and gave it to the visitors as a roll. So when we got information about this work, we had quite intense conversations about whether is it a work? Is it a printed uh, kind of brochure? Uh, is it something that was intended to be thrown away? Is it something intended to be kept, etc., etc.? This is one, I think, one very clear example when you see the ambivalence of, of the materials that we were dealing with, where you can really, you have to, you are forced to take a position and decide, okay, I consider this um, a work of art or, or maybe not. And um, I thought it would be interesting to share it with you. This is another example. This was intended to be in the exhibition, but then in the end we didn't, we didn't have it. Um, but this is a piece by Vera Chavez Barcelos, who is a Brazilian artist who was very, very, very active in terms of uh, printed materials. I mean, she did a lot of other things. She did a lot of photography, a lot of performance. Uh, she ran an archive. She had a magazine for a time. But she also has done a lot of uh, artist publication through her, through her life. So the medium is very well known to her. And she has done artist books and posters and many different things. But she also did this. And this is, as you see, an envelope that contains, I think it's like eight uh, different prints, which were printed in offset, um, rather small. And they have on the one side uh, an image, well, usually of architectural settings, either inside or outside. And then on the other side, one or two very simple questions, such as, what do you see in this picture? Or what is it that you think this uh, means? No. And the work was intended to be actually something like a performance prop. She um, did it for, I think it was the, the Sao Paulo Biennial and then the Venice Biennial, or the other way around, I don't remember. There are several versions of this work. Um, but what she did was to just uh, go up to the visitors and show them the images and then expect the, the reactions in a way to kind of um, sort of start a reflection about how people, uh, or what is the re what, what are the reception mechanisms of people in a context like a biennial, for instance, no? So this work is interesting because we have, I mean, Camilo and I have discussed what is the format of this piece, and we have still not come to any conclusion. This is clearly not an artist book. It's clearly not a print, which was printed in offset. Um, it's also not a postcard. It's, it's not an invitation card, and I can name a lot of things that it is not, but I have trouble naming one, which is, very clear and specific, and this is defined in the catalog, in the publication that the Center of Book Arts is issuing now. This has been defined as artist publication because I have really not found any better word. So um, that's also an issue that you have to deal with when you're like in, a, in, a, in the kind of research that I was in. Um, there are not always the names for things that you are finding, and, and um, I mean there uh, is some need to be creative sometimes to think about new names because we not, don't necessarily have them for everything that we can that we can come across. This is another amazing work, which I unfortunately don't have in the exhibition because I didn't come to New York early enough. Uh, this is in the New York Public Library collection, and I only saw it, yeah, it's actually there for you to see afterwards. It's a beautiful thing. Um, it's, a, it's a brochure, but I have not had the opportunity to research exactly what it was done for or how it, is, was, how it was meant to work. 
It's from one of the artists that we have in the show, Regina Bater, who's also Brazilian and who has also been extremely active in the field of publications. She's one of the interesting personalities in the show because she has a career which has been moving like in zigzag between fine arts and applied arts, which is also something that brings confusion sometimes to, 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 like to, the, to our detection system. Um, this is beautiful. You can have a look at it afterwards. And uh, as I say, I didn't have it in the exhibition because I didn't see it early enough. But I would have had it, and it would have been like perfect for the selection of works that we have in the in the center. And this is another another kind of particular case that was also like um, that required a little bit more uh, thinking than, than some of the other publications. This is Ana Mendieta. I don't know if you have ever seen this artist book. This um, was done in, a, in an edition of 40 copies by Ana Mendieta and Carl André when they spent one year living in Rome in the 80s, in 84. So the book is co-authored by both of them. Um, I was, I. Like for a long time, I didn't know that this book existed. And then one day I found it. And then I was fascinated by the fact that I hadn't found it before. Being Ana Mendieta, so important as she is. But then, of course, I mean, there are all of the controversies related to her death, etc., which I thought would be the reason why uh, this book has not been shown or discussed or, or you know, made uh, visible more often. But in any case, uh, we really wanted to have it, and it took us a long time to get it. I think it was, I was saying this yesterday to somebody in the opening, I think it was one of the last pieces that were included in the, in the checklist, even though it had been there all of the time. But it was not so easy to get, to get a, loan, a loan of this book. But we did have it in the end. And so um, when I started preparing this talk and sent Paloma the list of names that I wanted her to check or we wanted to, to check together to see whether there was something in the New York Public Library that we could kind of uh, establish a link with. Um, Paloma told me about this other work, which is also in the New York Public Library collection, not in the same collection as this one. I think uh, Regina Bater is in the regular reference collection. And this is in the special collections, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Um, and this is interesting because it's actually, I mean, it, it has a very particular dating. It is a series of, um, of it, it is based on a series of photographs out of which photo engravings were done. There were five sets of these photo engravings that were done while Ana Medieta was still alive. One of them is signed by her, the other four are not signed. And then, uh, but, but it seems that uh, the intention of Ana Mendieta was to produce a series of 20 copies, of which only five were done. And then she died. And then uh, years later, this, the estate of Ana Mendieta, in collaboration with the Galerie Le Long, decided to continue the series up to the 20 um, copies that, that were intended at the very beginning. So you have like one set which is signed by the artists by the artist, five, set, or five sets, including the one signed, which were done during the artist's life, and then 15 other copies, which were done afterwards. Um, in collaboration with also really relevant print artists, such as Luis Kamnitzer and Liliana Porter, who is also in the show, I mean, with, with other works. So um, we're already getting into kind of uh, obscure depths in terms of authorship here a little bit. But also in terms of what is an artist publication and what can be considered an artist publication in this particular case. Um, when we came to, to visit the, um, I mean, you will see it, it's outside in the vitrine. And you will see, you will also see the page that was printed with a description of this information that I'm giving, uh, that I'm giving you now. In this page, it is, the work is described as a book, but it is actually like independent leads. And, um, when we first saw it here, we were surprised at the fact that catalog that in the catalog it it doesn't appear once, but it has been described page by page, which never happens to books. I mean, when you talk about a book, you just describe it once, and it includes all of the pages. Which, but, but I think I, I think I've been thinking about that. I think it's interesting. It probably reflects the conflict that the catalog cataloging person had when dealing with this which is described as a book, but it's actually a collection, I mean, a set of prints, of independent prints. Um, so you see here also frictions that have to do, again, with market issues, with marketing questions, with questions that have to do with authorship, etc., etc. 
this is a book that I am very happy to have in the show. It's not here, but you can see it in the in the in the exhibition at the Center for Book Arts. You can here you can see other books by the same photographer, by Barbara Brendley, who was a Swiss young woman who landed in Venezuela at the beginning of the 70s or 60s. I'm, I don't no longer remember and stayed for her whole life there. Um, the interesting thing about this book, uh, which is kind of very known, very well known in the field of photo books, is that, uh, like from the cover onwards, it is signed by three different people, and these people are these people are the photographer, and the person who wrote the texts, but also the graphic designer, which is something very uncommon. You know? It's it's really not common to have like three different professionals signing the book as as uh, their authors. This is another book that we have in the show and that you also have here, right? If I'm not wrong, it's, it, there's a copy in the New York Public Library that you can browse afterwards there. It's one of my favorite pieces in the show, even if it's one of the less spectacular in, in terms of visual kind of um, appeal, if you want. This was done by another photographer whose name was Alicia D'Amico. She was Argentinian. She was um, like relevant in many, many different ways. Among other things, she founded a publishing house with another woman photographer who was who was called uh, Sara Fatio. Both of them, together with a, with a Guatemalan photographer, founded the first photo book publishing house in Latin America. She did a lot of work for other people as well as producing her own books, and we have several of her works in the exhibition. The interesting thing about this one is that it was, um, this is a project which was kind of initiated by her together with two sociologists who wanted to do some kind of visual and written survey about, about a, um, a kind of a depressed area of Buenos Aires. So she was the one who took the photographs, but she also talked a lot to the people who, took, who were photographed in, in the images. And the text, I mean, for the most part, the, I think this book has an introduction and uh, um, an afterword written by the sociologists. But for the most part, the text that you find accompanying the photographs is um, basically taken out of quotes of the conversations that they had with the people who were photographed. So the usual distance between the um, photographer who's the subject and the object who's the person who's being photographed is completely broken here because what you what you see and what you read as comments for the photographs are um, actually things that the people who were photographed said, uh, where they explain a lot of things about their neighborhood, but they also explain a lot of things about their own lives and expectations and, and many different things. This book is also interesting because it was, even if it's published and, you know, bound and sold and everything, it was never conceived as the end of the project. It was just one step. And this is very clearly also uh, stated in the book. This is just one step in the research that we're carrying out, and it is supposed to be uh, continued by other, you know, photographic surveys, other series of interviews, other publications, etc., etc. So it also connects very well to this idea that I was mentioning at the beginning, that I relate to the word ensayo, where you have something which is definite, but at the same time, it's not like the very last word in, in what you're doing. And I encourage you to have a look afterwards at it. So I don't know how much I have. It's more or less, uh, we're on time, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I could go on for hours, <laughs> but I'm not going to be so mean. I think I should stop here. Um, and I'm really looking forward to continuing the dialogue, the dialogue that I had with all of these people that helped me and with Camilo, now with you who are here and also with Sevina. But I just wanted to mention that um, <coughs> since this is an ensayo and I truly see it as an ensayo, I hope, I mean, I'm very happy. I'm really, really happy about the exhibition that we have built together. I think it's an important exhibition because it brings together things that have not been brought together so far. But I think it's also very much a beginning. It's absolutely not a conclusive exhibition. And it should never be taken as the very best of or the kind of the greatest works in the field of or whatever. It's just the beginning. It's, it's um, if you want a gesture to open the folder and start filling it with more, with more um, kind of research and more contents. But, um, at the same time, it is, of course, a statement. Um, what I wanted to share with you, so as to finish, is uh, are some of the questions that I still have in my mind, and I keep, you know, hearing them resonate, and I have not answered them. And it would be very nice to share them with you and see what we can make out of them together, if you want. One of them is obviously what is the impact of the gender gap in what is considered good or bad aesthetic 
or good or, or bad taste. And this connects to what I mentioned at the beginning that Andrea Junta said. I mean, one of the things that happened to me um, was that when I started finding materials, I was a little bit in shock because they, were, they didn't look as I expected they would look. Uh, they were different to what I knew uh, as artist publications from the conceptual period, blah, 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 blah. And so um, I had to kind of reset a little bit my mind to see, to see them in a different way or to have a different gaze um, towards them. And I think it's interesting to kind of um, socialize this idea and ask ourselves how have we um, kind of built our taste and how we can change it by incorporating new materials to the canon. And so in relation to that, what happens to the canon once you can kind of get these kind of new materials into it? Because what I believe is that um, it's not just that we make more space and bring in new artists, but I believe very much that what we bring in necessarily changes the way we see what was already there. Uh, this is something that we could discuss like for many hours also, but I think it's, a, it's one of the relevant questions that I hope the, the exhibition will kind of pose. Um, the other thing which is also complex is what is the role of standard classification systems in the fact that these publications have not been taken into account so far. How much uh, standardization is actually very castrating in terms of you know, erasing things that don't match into what has been set as cages for, for categories. And I think it would be like really great to discuss this with librarians and with artists and even with museum curators who also work with, you know, um, sets of categories sometimes. And then the last question, which is really hard to answer, I think in this context, but I want to pose it to you in any case, is what is a feminist exhibition? Because it was very clear to me that I was taking a standpoint which was feminist in what I was doing, but then you have to actually set the materials in the white cube. And I guess um, it's not so obvious to me how you do that in a feminist way. And I, um, I tend to sometimes, I, I really like reading th theory, but sometimes I miss a little bit more practical, you know, um, discussion about how do you do these things in, in ways which are really feminist. So it really changes the way in which things are perceived. So thank you very much <laughs> for your attention. I wake up Sibina. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emela. That was amazing. And I want to emphasize the, way, the word important because I, I, as soon as Paloma invited me to participate, thank you, Paloma. Thank you, Camilo. Um, I thought this is really important. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> so thank you. And. Uh, the, the exhibition is called Off Register, and I was just thinking that this brings to mind the word off stage. And so thank you for pushing to the center of the scene, these artists and works that were not there. And I wanted to ask you, how did you come up with the title Off Register and the multiple meanings implied? Yeah. That, that was a very difficult thing. I mean, it, it was really difficult to find a title for this show. Um, we took, I think, weeks or months uh, considering different possibilities. Um, I, I always find it really difficult to, I mean, titles are for me one of the like very difficult things in projects. Um, but in this particular case, I came up with this title when I was trying to explain to the graphic designers that were going to do the book what I was uh, kind of bringing together in the selection. And, um, when I was trying to explain this, I found myself, I was having this discussion in Spanish. Luckily, I, we found a term that works both in Spanish and English with this double meaning. No? So I was trying to explain them that what we were bringing together was not a very conventional selection of artist publications, but rather a selection that um, felt as if it were a little kind of moved or out of register. You know, when you print, uh, you have to print four colors, they have to fall exactly one top of the other, if, they, if the machine or the paper move a little bit, then people say, printer people, uh, printing people say this is misregistered or out of register because the colors don't ma exactly match. And if the colors don't exactly match, you still see the image, but you see it in a distorted way, which is really uncomfortable or, or a little bit uncomfortable. It really depends. But this feeling of, of, of like, uh, this feeling of, of the, the, this feeling yourself uncomfortable with what you're seeing was very much what I was trying to convey. And so I came up with this kind of visual metaphor. It, it is the same as when you're printing and you move the 
And then we were like, oh my God, but this has actually two meanings because it means that the print, the print run was wrong because it was misregistered, but it also means that the register didn't take this thing up, these things up. So things have not been registered, they don't belong into the archive. And fascinatingly, it works in Spanish as well. When you say fuera de registro, this is what the printers say, but this is also what you can say in an archive about what has, which, that which has not been recorded. So this is how we found it, and we thought it was, it felt appropriate. And, uh, but I want to very much underline this kind of um, nuance of discomfort, because I think this is also something important to, you know, bear with, <laughs> with the, with, in, in the context of the project. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And also, um, what, is, what is not registered also, como no, que no se registra, no? Como que no se ve. Exactly. Um, so, uh, you, you, in, in the text that accompanies, and I very much recommend the catalog that's going to be out with the Center for Book Arts that accompanies this exhibition. And um, you, you talk about a, a necessary exercise of unlearning in relation with uh, artists books and then the transformation of that uh, focus onto uh, artist publications. Can you talk about that difference and unlearning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this, this um, was not expected, but came about as, as I was working. And this, again, has to do with this feeling of discomfort. It has to do with this feeling of like searching for something and finding something else, which was not exactly what I was kind of uh, expecting to find. Um, it was really not intended. I was seriously looking for conceptual artist books made by women. <laughs> so I kind of expected in a very naive way at the beginning that I would find the female Sol Louis and the female Lawrence Weiner and the female, I don't know, <laughs> you name it. But it, um, it was not like that. And it was surprising at the beginning. And I, I, had, I had trouble in the same way that I had trouble discuss, uh, kind of defining the categories of the materials that I was, that I was kind of coming across. I had a lot of trouble realizing that, uh, until I realized that it was actually a matter of kind of learned taste and learned um, validation criteria that I had. I was, uh, you know, I had a set of tools that were not working for the things that I had in front of me or that I was getting. And so I, I was at some point like very clearly noticing how I had to get rid of all of my expectations and of all of, all of my analysis tools so as to come up with something different which would work for those materials which I was finding. And this is this connects to what I was just saying about how does this affect the canon that we already know. If we use, if we start using different tools and we have a different gaze, it will probably affect the way in which we see that which we already knew. But there's a lot of like, um, I mean, the, it, it was really a, a very intense pro process of getting rid of you know, expectations that were much deeper inside me than I was aware of. Um, and this is something that is a little bit more like explained in depth in, in the catalog. It really has a lot of implications, but I think it's it's very necessary so as to be able to evaluate what you see in the exhibition probably, no? And to be able to open different categories from those which we already know where we can fit these other materials that we have not seen so far. So it's really, it doesn't work with the tools that we had so far, you have to develop new ones, absolutely. Yeah, and I, as you were talking, I was remembering when we were talking here on the side and you mentioned, I love that you mentioned that you are not only questioning uh, the gaze of the audience and the gaze of what's uh, included or not, but also your own mm -hmm. uh, process and your own perspective. Mm -hmm. And talking about perspective, you, I think you have it in one of your questions, but uh, you talked about how this exhibition, it was, Planned, put together, and uh, put into the space as a feminist from a feminist perspective. So, what can you say about that and about the way it was? It's very interesting the way it was put in the space as a circular, mm -hmm. a continuous um, recorrido. Yes, I mean, as I as I just mentioned, this was one of the things that was worrying me really very much in the final stages of the process, and it still continues to worry me, and it's something that I really want to do some more research seriously about. What is a feminist exhibition, or how do you how do you exhibit works in a feminist way, or in a way which is not, which, you know, um, there's this quote, uh, you, cannot, um, you cannot destroy the master's house with the master's tools, you have to find new tools again. 
So um, how do you do exhibitions differently if you really want to work in a feminist uh, way? Because it has to go beyond the topic. It doesn't, I mean, it wouldn't be enough just to choose feminist topics and then continue to reproduce the same exhibition system that we have. But it's, that's hard to answer. One of the, I mean, I, I took several decisions which I guess you could, I mean, you could take them to point into that direction. One of them is um, I decided not to be guided by the classical categories. So we have, for instance, photo books together with the artist books. Because I think, um, and I've been thinking this for a long time, I think, I mean, you have plenty, you have probably millions of definitions of what an artist book is. But um, to me, what is relevant is that there is an, an, a cre creative intention on the side of the artist or artists who have created it, and a very clear intention to work with the format, not only with the content, so that the format also has a meaning, whatever kind of meaning that is. So I think that you find that very much also in photo books, where you cannot really detach the form from the content. And if you do it, then you have a different thing, which is not the photo book. You have a series of photographs or a photographic essay or whatever. But um, I think basically the same spirit is, is behind them. So we have photo books, uh, which have been labeled photo books so far. We also have artist books that could be labeled photo books and uh, photo books that could be labeled artist books and have been in, in different cases. And, and this is, you know, I wanted to very much um, kind of represent uh, those slippery areas or gray areas where you don't really know exactly what something is. You know? um, so we have very different formats. We also even have, uh, in one particular case, we have um, an artist from, from Colombia, Feliz Agustin, who never did an artist publication, but she worked with graphic designers who were particularly creative in producing the printed matter for her shows in ways which go beyond the standard exhibition brochure or the standard exhibition catalog. So we also have that in the show. Um, so one thing was like to you know move into slippery areas in terms of in terms of categories and mix up things which are usually not so um, mixed up in, in museum context. Then the other thing was uh, absolutely re to reject categories such as dating and uh, country of origin or country of publication or I don't know this kind of very classical uh, standard classification systems and have the works organized in terms of. Um, topics or themes if you want. And this is of course risky because I'm putting together things that probably maybe were not even meant to be together at the time they were created. But I thought it would be interesting to try to connect things in, in kind of uh, suggestive ways which would ex escape a little bit the classical kind of regular standardization of, of labels. And then the other thing was this thick circular thing which comes or derives a little bit from what I just said. If I if I do a classification which is thematic, I think it's interesting to plan it in, in a circular form instead of having a beginning, a progress, and an end, uh, which is also a way in which art historians, we art historians and art critics like very much to explain things, but things not always have a beginning and a process and an end. Um, it's not how the world works <laughs> every time. So what I tried to do is to, to build something which where you could like go in, cir in circles and always have a connection with the next thing that you have. This is how far I got, but you probably have other ideas, I hope. <laughs> but I love that because it's a way of uh, involving the audience and make them uh, participate in the process, as this artist used to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this again has to do with this um, feeling of, of being uncomfortable. I think the audience are quite, um, we don't have world labels, for instance, we only have numbers. And there's a list that you can, that you probably have some of you already. You have to check up the details, the technical details and name of the author and, and date and everything in the list, which is not on the wall. This is already demanding, I think, for the public. Um, the, or, the organization, the, the arrangement of the works is demanding because it doesn't, um, up, it doesn't comply with any of the usual logics that you find. So yeah, I guess there's some, some sort of um, like maybe heavier load on the audience side. I don't know, but this is for you to judge. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I mean, I didn't think it, I didn't, I was not, um, I was not trying to make it difficult, um, but I was trying to make it a little less loaded with, with preconceived categories. And this is what I came up with. I don't know how it would work. But it's uh, difficult in a compelling way. Mm -hmm. I, I hope. hope. Yeah. <laughs>
So please go and see the exhibition. And um, are there any, well, some of them you already shared, but any challenges or joys in particular that you want to, to share about the backstage of putting together this um, exhibition? I mean, there were, there were many, many, many reasons to be happy and celebrate during the process. Um, in some cases, it has been particularly moving. As I said, this is for me very much the beginning. You, I mean, anybody who's more or less knowledgeable in, in Latin American contemporary art, or even in, in kind of Western contemporary art, will find names that are very familiar, like Ana Mendieta, like Beatriz Gonzalez, like some other, some other artists. Then I think it will happen that some of you may have never heard of some of the artists, but in general, you can find bibliography about almost all of them, with one or few, one or two exceptions. And those are probably, um, I mean, one of them is clearly Beatriz Jaramillo, who's a Colombian artist that has not been in the bibliography so much so far. She was extremely difficult to reach. Uh, she has not, I mean, she has been kind of well mannered and nice, but always very dry and 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 not really wanting to start a conversation. You know, I'm happy that you do this, but don't bother me too much with it. <laughs> Which is okay. I mean, why should she be excited? <laughs> There's no reason to be excited for her. It is for me. Um, but I found I didn't know anything about her. I the, the very little that I, that I found at the beginning was really amazing. And then we came here to the New York Public Library and we, we found like three very beautiful photographs. Two of them you will see outside on the on the vitrines. So I think this, this is one case where you see, oh, wow, this is nice. It's nice that she's in the exhibition, but this completely opens up a whole set of new questions for me that I want to follow up afterwards. You know, it is stimulating to continue researching about her and what she did. It's also interesting in this case because we are with Jaramillo, you know, um, and I open a parenthesis here. One of the things you were asking about feminist, uh, you know, perspectives. One of the things that I had to do a lot of thinking about was: Will I mention the sentimental liaisons of these women with male artists, or will I not? Because some of them were involved in in emotional relationships beyond, you know, work relationships with some artists that we know very well. Um, that was a hard question to answer. I was like doubting a lot of time, but then in the end I decided I wouldn't because I thought, no, I mean, this is, of course, it's important context information, but for once I just wanted to talk about their work and not necessarily go out, go again and mention, yeah, she was a lover of who, whatever. Also because I, most of the times I don't have proof of that information except for what I read in the books and who am I to say, you know, <laughs> who was in love with whom. No? But in any case, I didn't mention that. But in the case of Beatriz Caramillo, the interesting thing is she was together with a male artist uh, from Medellin as well, where she was active. And they decided to start um, a magazine and they um, so founded a magazine which was named Sobre Arte, which means about art. But it also means envelope art in Spanish. Yeah? And so at the beginning it was just about art because it was a regular magazine which was bound and stapled and you know very plainly known and, mm, in, the, in terms of form. And then I found an essay, a, a very long essay about this magazine. And in the essay, it was stated it was a very conventional magazine, and Beatriz Jaramillo was um, appeared, mentioned, or credited as deputy director or vice director in the in the first three numbers. And then um, the format completely changed because they chose to, you know, switch to the other meaning of the of the expression and start producing an envelope instead of a, of a regular magazine where they would assemble uh, collaborations by other artists. So in this classical, you know, assembling way where you request people to send you things and you get 20 copies of, of each thing and then you kind of organize them in, in, in different envelopes. So the essay that I found was all the time stressing how important the male artist had been in the magazine and how it was his project that he was done doing with his, with his partner, etc. But then it also mentioned that uh, the moment that happened, Beatriz Jaramillo started being credited, accredited as um, deputy director and became the co-director. But it never, it didn't go beyond that. It never mentioned that maybe, wow, that was important in the fact that the format had changed, etc. So, um, I mean, I was particularly moved to have her in the exhibition because I thought, wow, I mean, it has been going on and probably she never really, she, she was never really kind of taken into account as somebody who was really taking decisions in this whole project of turning the magazine into a more of a male art experiment, etc. Whereas, like the actual facts, when you see the credit listings of the magazine point 
to that direction. No? So this is one case, for instance, where I was particularly happy to have the to have the works, but there were many. I mean, there was. I really love the work of Regina Silveira, for instance, who is a Brazilian artist who's still very active, whom I met in Spain uh, once when she came. She has a wonderful piece, which is called Brazil Today, which is in the exhibition. We really want to have it. Regina was like hesitant. Hmm, shall I lend it or not? Because I only have one in my archive, and you know. You're not a museum with 24-hour surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. It has to be sent in ways which are maybe dangerous, la, la, la. So in the end, I mean, I respect that. She decided that she would rather not lend it. But then Camilo was kind of beating up the bush everywhere <laughs> until he found it in a library in the US. And then we had it. And that was you know, super big news to me. That was great. And I'm very happy that it is in the show. Many, many, many. I think I could probably tell one or two stories about each one of the, of the 80 works. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mela, for deciding to just focus on the, these women artists yeah. and not the narratives and kind of. Yeah. And uh, thank you for this. And maybe now we can open the conversation if anyone wants to ask any questions. <laughs> First of all, thank you for wonderful and dialogue and presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you. How much do you think? Is there a lot more to be discovered from this period? You've no. been researching a long time. Mm -hmm. Or I, maybe what percentage have you found? <laughs> roughly? That's, that's, um, that's hard to say, but I mean, I can just guess that it is probably maybe 20% of what can be found. You know, one of the things, and I think we were talking yesterday about that, and right before the beginning of this conversation, we were also talking about that. When I, when I um, like going back to this question, what is it that we're not seeing? It is not just us, it is also the artists very often. Okay. When you ask the artists, what do you have? Did you produce any artist books or artist publications? I mean, in, in many instances, they said, no, no, I didn't do anything. And then it's like, oh, but listen, I found in this magazine a reproduction in black and white of this thing, which I thought it was a postcard, was it not? Oh, yes, yes, that was a postcard that I did. And so things started kind of coming up. But they were not um, filing these things themselves into the category of their art production. So this is something um, which is surprising, but it was quite common. I mean, you also, most of the artists that are in the show didn't produce a massive amount of, of printed works, which is something which you find in, in very many male artists. Like one of the things that I used to consider one of the, my main personal criteria to evaluate um, the production of an artist publication artist was consistency. And consistency means that you have ideas that you kind of work on along your life. And this is not the case for many of the artists that are in the show. You don't have this kind of consistency over the decades. Because it was just not probably not important, not well received, not given attention, whatever. So they did what they could and then they gave it up and it was just fine. So I can imagine, I mean, I would have loved to be in the archives of these, I think, 37 women that we have in the show. Because I think, I'm sure, I mean, it's not that I think, I'm sure that I would have found more stuff. Uh, out of the of these 37 archives and I'm sure there are many I mean I haven't not you know the bad thing about the whole project is that I did it from a very kind of uh, long distance I, I was very far away I didn't go to the archives um, so I think when somebody and I hope many people would do when they go to the archives and start we see the material I mean the material kind of real stuff there will be more things coming up I'm absolutely sure I mean this is maybe maybe 20 percent but maybe even less no? Thank you so much. It was very interesting to listen to you. I think this uh, topic is really uh, appassionante, <laughs> really interesting. And uh, I have two questions. The first one is how you chose the, those artists, those specifically 47 artists, and uh, why those specifically? And the second one is about um, what you were saying about how the, uh, you organized them in the, in the exhibition show. Um, which, uh, what, what are they talking about? How did you uh, came up with uh, the, the problems or the themes that were in common? Uh, you, if you see things they were talking about in those periods that were maybe related to why they were like uh, kept in silence in the ar archives or, uh, and like how, how do they dialogue? Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, 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 I mean, 
one fact which is um, always like this, but I guess more in this particular case is, is I think Camilo named this a very mundane question recently, which is well, you can show what you can get. You cannot show what you cannot get. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that I couldn't get. I mean, not so much in the end, not so much that we really wanted, but I'm sure, I mean, many, as I said, like many important works which are in museums could never be in the exhibition at the Center for Book Arts for just, you know, um, uh, logistic reasons, if you want. Um, um, so uh, the other thing is I was doing this research in Europe. I, I am based in Germany and Spain, and I was kind of moving between the two countries, more in Spain for research, because I have more access to Latin American materials in Spain than in Germany, but still really far away from where I would have found more information. It's, I mean, Latin America is huge, <laughs> as we all know. So talking about Latin America, we actually have, I think, uh, people from eight or nine different countries, but it's not, it's not uh, most of the countries in Latin America. So um, um, what we have is, uh, well, we, I, I started by seeing, okay, besides my own survey, which I already showed you, which was something very kind of basic and familiar in, in scientific terms, if you want, I went to the bibliography and I started checking who are the important women artists from Latin America from the period, and this is this was the beginning. No? So I started kind of pulling these threads and seeing where they would take me. And once you start having access to people who knew about the period or who were much, much more connected, or even the artists, I mean, artists were an amazing source of information. Like, we may have not known these artists, but they did know each other in most cases and for the most part. And so they knew, and when they knew about my research, they went like through the list and said, do you have works by these and these and these and these and these? No. At the beginning I didn't, but then in the end it was also a nice way to check that we were on the right um, kind of way because we were coinciding with what the artists were suggesting. So, but there's much more to do, as, as I said, no? Uh, so this is the first question. In terms of topics, you know, the other, one of the other amazing discoveries was to see how much topics or how much thematically these works speak to us nowadays. No? I, um, if you go and see the exhibition, the exhibition is a very kind of classic white cube with four words, and uh, works are more or less arranged thematically in each one of the four words. The first one uh, has some, I mean, different kinds of experiments with language that go from, you know, the wake of, of concrete poetry in, in Brazil to more, um, like, exp more, more um, to other experiments with re representations of reality through language in Liliana Porte, etc. Um, then the second one has much more to do with pro political propaganda and political issues, which are quite often transparent, but quite often really difficult to get from our contemporary perspective. And we really need an, some kind of context or explanation in some cases. Then the third wall, the third wall is kind of um, depicts different ways to connect with the body, and not necessarily the female body, but also the female body, and how the body has been attacked or being subject to, to repression and violence by political instances in many cases, because you know there were a lot of countries that were having like really hard political issues in these decades. And so how does this actually matter to my own physical body it was a very strong, and this is, I think, I mean, when, when you see these books, you think you're, like you're being spoken to like right now on the spot. They are extremely contemporary in many cases. And then the last one is also extremely contemporary because it has to do with this tension between nature and civilization and indigenism, if you want, or, or kind of local um, civilization and foreign or colonial civilization being placed on top of that. And this is what, what, what is more contemporary than this, no? <laughs> even if they were done 50 years ago. So, so this is more or less how it is structured. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for this uh, amazing presentation. I um, have not been in the exhibition yet, but uh, I have um, some considerations. First, I will dare to um, su suggest um, an answer for the last question, and is that <laughs> the art education uh, is, um, I imagine it's a potent tool to open up these discussions with women girls, uh, like paying attention to the intersectionality of this feminism, feminist 
approach uh, of this vision. So, and my question is about the Brazilian context specifically, since some scholars have pointed out that um, uh, some women were integrated in the arts, it's not the runners uh, of uh, innovations in, within mediums and content since modernism to contemporary art. So the evidence it uh, in the exhibition, this uh, role of women in, in the canonical art, uh, if we can put <laughs> in these terms like Lilia Pape and uh, Vera Chavez Barcelos, is a bit important regionally. So how, how do you compare it with other contexts? Even um, we, we want to divide it nationally uh, in canons, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. This is interesting. Um, it was it happened very quickly that we started noticing, or I started noticing, that the situation in Brazil was very different. Um, because the big names were already there and were already like better known. Um, at least uh, in the kind of uh, field of general art, or if you want, like in, in Lilia Pape is a well-known artist, and, and like there are others in, in other uh, Brazilian artists who have been like very much discussed and are well represented that, and are very visible. But their artist publications are not, that. Um, because this is again a very closed and probably conservative field, I guess. I mean, and, and this is the reason why I started this research in the first place. Why? Is it happening that in every other field we're going through, I mean, we're kind of reshaping our selection of materials and in the artist book field, we continue to talk about the same 20, you know, white male artists all of the time when discussing the 60s and the 70s in particular. No? So, um, so it was a kind of, um, like for instance, if you take the first work that you see when you come into the lobby of the Center for Book Arts is, uh, one work that I'm very particularly proud that we have, which is um, O Libro da Criazao, the Ligia Pape, of which only three copies exist in the world. One of them is in MoMA, <laughs> one of them is in Museo Re Reina Sofia, where I saw it for the first time, and I think the third one it belongs to the family. So it was kind of impossible to have that work in the show. But we did uh, find that we did find out that the that Ligia Pape had uh, filmed this work in a in a film of fear of. Um, which has a duration of four minutes, and this is what we got from the estate. We got the permission to show the film. And when you see the film, which was, I mean, the film was shot in 1959-60, but the book is from 1959. You probably know Bruno Munari, all of you. And Bruno Munari is very well known. Has the, there are a lot of publications about him. When you see this film, you ask yourself, why has Ligia Pape never really been connected to Bruno Munari, for instance? Even though she's very well known, it's, uh, there's absolutely no question about that. The question which is interesting to me here, and which I still don't have an answer for, is why were Brazilian women so extremely visible and active in those years when it was completely different in the other Latin American countries? But this is something that I will have to get deeper into, you know, history and art history research to find out, because I still don't know myself. It's one of the open questions that remain. Um, so this was one of your questions, I think, was, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was it, no, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm just curious about um, like the revisionist history of it all, especially since you're considering, um, as you mentioned earlier, that a lot of the women artists that you were speaking to like didn't even remember their own works. And so I'm curious in looking back at works, how that is particularly influenced by being book arts, since you're saying that it's more um, closed off and book arts in general, I feel like aren't as included in the canon of art history and are often forgotten and if that relates to like women's own censorship of their work um, in relation to like paper since it's like the tangibility of it and um, is different in, in the art making so yeah yeah I mean um, I, I think uh, there are different lines that, that connect here in this in this particular point that you mentioned I think um, the question of being of things being marketable or not of course plays an issue. It doesn't only play an issue for women, it plays an issue for the whole, you know, art market market system and for the whole art system also. What has been like um, valued with a very high financial or economical uh, price is 
different from what doesn't have such a big price. And this is many years ago when I started the collection of artist publications at the museum where I was working in Barcelona. That was, you know, an ongoing discussion, an endless discussion with the collection department. This is very cheap. It goes to the archive. And it's like, no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It doesn't have to do with how much money you paid for the thing. You may have paid a lot of money for something which is really valuable for, for a publication by Gera Trister, if you want. But if it's a publication, then it goes to the archive. It doesn't go to the collection and the other way around. It may be, you know, a piece of paper that was done in a print run of 20,000. It costs three dollars in the corner shops but it's still an artist publication then it goes into the archive so this is one thing i mean some of you who work in institutions here will be you know totally familiar with this it's not it's something that continues to happen even though 15 or 20 years have gone by since we started you know claiming that artist publications or even longer you know because this is when i started but there were other people before who had started so there's one issue that has to do with, with um, things being sold or being able to be sold or being valued by the art market, which I think affects male and, and female artists alike. And of course, it has an impact, I think, in, in, our, in the artist's way to value their work. And then there's this thing with, with consistency. And this is something that it would also, it would also be very like, interesting to discuss in, in a kind of an, with, with more time. You know, one of the things that I did when I started writing the essay was try to con con contextualize this exhibition in New York specifically, what had been done in terms of women artist publications before or in terms of Latin American artist publications before, here in the 70s, when, when people were starting to do exhibitions. Um, and I have to mention this, it sounds like an anecdote, but I think it has a, a deeper meaning. Uh, I think to my knowledge, the first, uh, exhibition of artist publications by, made by women artists was organized by Lucy Lee Park in a gallery which was called Air Gallery or a, I mean, I don't know if I pronounce it like the way it is, but you probably know the space. And I found a lot of information about this ex that exhibition, even though it's not in the, it's not in the canonical, you know, artist book history books, but it, the, you'll find a lot of information online and there's included, among other things, the press release. And the press release, uh, in the press release, it is described how something like, um, I mean, I say it by heart, but it's something like women have been putting their anger and emotions and feelings and, you know, uh, wishes and frustrations into the printed form for, for a long time now. That was written at the time so as to advertise the exhibition of women artist publications. And if you, if, I, I mean, I cannot help read it today and think what, does it sound like if I change the word men, I mean women, to men, and if I read men have been putting their frustrations and emotions and, you know, it sounds ridiculous, no? So um, I, I think, um, I mean, there are so many layers of, of prejudices that we all have, uh, not in, like in general, in, in life, not only in art, but this comes to art, and these artists, female or women artists, don't escape to that, so they probably also, you know, have, have this kind of ways to evaluate things in terms of, okay, this is, I did this, but it was not so important. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess it happens at the time. And this is why, I mean, I, we found a lot, but there's much more to be found because it has not been identified yet, probably as artistic production, no? I think. How are we doing? Yeah, how, <laughs> I think we would like to have some time for you to browse the publication, so it would be nice maybe if we stop here. But yeah, do you want to show the catalog? Oh, oh yes, because the, the yellow is the the, the exhibition brochure, yeah. sure. and that's the catalog. The, this is still you know an emergency digital copy. I don't know if it's, <laughs> it's, it's being printed and it's going to be available in a few maybe three weeks or something or four weeks at the Center for Book Arts. If you want to oh. get deeper into the matter, you have to read the text. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a list of the books that you have here, in case you want to come back and consult. So thank you very much.